Alrighty. Well, first of all, it's such a great thing to be speaking here at DevOps Day Silicon Valley. I really love this conference. They do all that they can to be really inclusive and uh, accessible for people. Um, and along those lines, I just have to say thank you to uh, Amanda, who is doing the captioning for this talk. Yay. Uh, I, I'm trying to butter Amanda up a little bit because I'm probably going to be talking pretty fast for most of this. So I want her to like me. Um, all right, so, well, thank you for spending time with me on this Friday afternoon. Um, my name is Emily Gladstone Cole, and I'm here to talk about how to be your security team's best friend. Um, my screen is awesome, wow. So a quick survey, how many of you do security work as part or all of your job description? A few hands, all right, cool. <laughs> I, I hope that all of you will learn something here. Um, so here's the agenda, first an introduction discussion of the CIS critical security controls, and then uh, as many additional security thoughts as I have time for. This is a lot of material, and I am going to be probably talking pretty fast. I'm going to try to slow myself down. Um, so standard disclaimer, the opinions expressed in this talk are my own and do not represent the views of my employer. And uh, the non-standard disclaimer, I hope you like cat photos. <laughs> So, okay, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I have a Unix sysadmin background. I started off supporting SunOS and DEC and IRIX and you know on and on and on up to <coughs> Solaris and FreeBSD and Linux. And then um, after a while of doing that, I realized that security operations experience is not that different from production operations experience. I mean, let's say you, um, you have a website that goes down and um, you need to figure out what's going on with it. Your first steps are gonna be about the same whether it's there's a problem in the code or something has crashed. So I was able to transition over into a security role. I've done incident response and security research and I just last week started a job at Agari, which does email security and still totally has that new job smell, so <laughs> I'm a little excited about that. Um, and uh, let's see, well, that's enough about me, so how, to, how you can contact me, but it's on the bottom of every slide, so let's move on to the interesting stuff. So Swift on security, in case you didn't know, <laughs> is um, the persona of Taylor Swift, pop star, millennial, and information security expert. So there is a lot of funny stuff on this, um, on this account, but there's also a lot of really interesting security stuff. This came up last week, and I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's exactly what I want to be talking about. So I think she really nailed it in this tweet. Um, so let's, uh, let's uh, what I'm going to be talking about is a collection of best practices and all around good ideas um, formatted as critical security controls that will sound a lot like tasks that you do in operations. So the Center, Net for, Center for Internet Security Critical Contur Security Controls, um, they are industry consensus guidelines that were developed by open participation by um, the community, and I really like that, the fact that anyone, if they, has opinion, they have opinions, can help build that consensus. Um, there are three types of controls, basic, foundational, and organizational. I'm pretty much gonna stick with the basic controls right now, but there are lots of great resources on the internet if you wanna drill in and learn more about the other types. So, um, this talk, it's not rocket science. This is not the one amazing trick that will shock and amaze your security team. No, this is um, a collection of some basic principles, things you're probably already doing that your security team will appreciate. Uh, but don't just take my word for it. Um, Rob Joyce with the NSA uh, is the head of the, I have to look at this, Tailored Access Operations Group, the nation state hackers, give a whole talk about um, the, how the basics are important. And he made the point that people are gonna start using the easiest things to break into your network. And so if you get those basic things right, then most of the hackers that are trying to hack you, 
they'll move on. They'll look at somebody else, and your systems are a little bit more secure and safe from attack. So um, critical control number one, hardware and asset inventory. Um, OK, so quickly, before I get started on number one, um, I should note that different versions of the controls have different numberings as the industry decides that one thing is more important or less important. And so things move around. There are numbers. So as you go looking in to drill in on these on the internet, you may find different numbering. Uh, for example, there's a, a great blog series that I list in the reference slide. And it has the old numbering. Uh, this talk is based on the latest numbering. OK, so that's a lot of lionesses and cubs, isn't it? Um, what if you? Uh, lost track of one. That, that might be a bad thing. <laughs> might be a little dangerous. Well, likewise, you want to keep track of your security assets. Just think how helpful it would be for your security gal if when she comes up to you and says, hey, there's this host name or this IP address that's behaving strangely, you can say to her, oh, I know exactly what that is. Here's your information. Or even better, if you give something, give her access to something that will be able to uh, let her do it your, herself without disturbing you. So these are the questions that you will probably need to answer uh, as about your hardware, um, like network access control. How do you know what's on your network? Um, how do you know if a new device is added? Um, a really great way to do this is actually to look at your DHCP logs. Um, if you have DHCP on your network, this is more of a home office thing than a production network thing, depending on your classification scheme. But if you look at the DHCP server logs, you can correlate that with your hardware database and see if there are any new devices appearing. Maybe you don't expect that. Um, hey, worth looking into. Uh, other things that you're definitely going to want to do around network access controls, you're going to want to do periodic scans of your IP space to make sure that you understand where uh, all of those IPs correlate to? Did you, you know, bring up a new virtual interface on a system? Did you bring up a new cluster? Well, you should be able to see that in your scans, and you should be able to tie that back to your hardware. Um, so automation, um, it's a good way to keep your assets in a known state. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to set up monitoring for things like broken hard drives. And you know, what if, uh, what if your power is no longer redundant? I realize this is not as much of an issue for most of us in the days of cloud, but if you do actually have on-prem hardware, it's, it's going to be something important to look at. Um, so let's see, asset management. Um, how do you keep track of them, right? Well, you do want a spreadsheet or a database or something. Preferably, it's a database that you can query and tie into your automation tools. But the other. Um, the other thing about this, you can use that same DHCP logging that you were using before to see what's on the network to make sure that you're, you are tracking those assets and you correlate it back in and um, you know who, where they are. Uh, but one thing to be aware of is shadow IT. Um, so it's trivially easy to open up a new AWS account and start creating instances or whatever you want to over there. And, or you know, if you put it, open up, uh, and if you open things up to the world, obviously that's bad. Um, or like creating a VM that's open to the internet, or um, anything else like that that your internal IT or operations or security team doesn't know about. Um, so this is where I start thinking, well, you know, why do they have, why do people do this? It's because they think that the IT or the operations team or the security team is a blocker. And I feel very strongly um, at the new organization I joined, I'm on the en engineering enablement team, which uh, I'm working with a bunch of DevOps folks on the tooling that is needed to help make the process of engineering easier. And I'm also, I got added in to help make adding security a lot easier for them to get the burden of that out of the way. So how do you, how do you prevent people from going and doing shadow IT? Well, my biggest thing is you build the relationships. I mean, this is something that we've heard over and over again in all the talks 
at this conference is you need to have empathy. You need to build relationships with people. And that is really important. It means that they are more likely to come to you. They're more likely to bring you their ideas and run things by you. And obviously, that's really important. The other thing that you can potentially do is talk to the people in finance or accounts payable because they're very likely to be able to tell you if somebody is spending a lot of money at AWS or if they're buying things like unauthorized software. So software, uh, software inventory. <laughs> if your security gal is investigating an incident, it'll be very helpful if you can tell her right away what software is installed on a particular machine without having to log in and check, because if you log in and check, then you've potentially contaminated the evidence. Obviously, that's bad. So you want to, other thing is, if you have a software inventory, if a vendor vulnerability report comes out, your security gal is going to want to know, does she need to run around and go crazy and try to fix it? Or is this something that we don't actually have, it's not relevant to us? Not that I've ever <laughs> run around like crazy based on a vendor vulnerability report, no, really. Um, so how do you automate this kind of effort? The, um, the inventory and control of software assets? Well, um, there are a bunch of things you can do to answer these questions. Um, one is you can use your automation or your anti-malware or your endpoint protection tools to track, um, track software on your systems and correlate that, bring it back into a database. Um, who installed the software? That's more about control. Um, Obviously, you're going to want to limit admin privileges. Um, one thing that works really well for this that I've seen is splitting up for a, somebody who is an administrator, splitting up the administrator role from their regular user role so that they can't accidentally do things as administrator. And it means that they have to go through that extra step in order to do administrator tasks. Um, it allows extra layers of logging, um, and it lets you lets you limit these things down a little bit more. And it also reduces the chances if somehow their user credential gets out there somewhere, their administrator credential is not also compromised. So um, other things that you definitely want to do is you want to log these kinds of things. Uh, who installed the software, as I kind of said. I mean, there will be more about logging later. But it's, it's important to be able to track these things back as you're finding something has happened. Um, so what does the software do? Uh, how do you control that? There are definitely a lot of next generation AV and endpoint protection tools that will help you figure out behaviorally what that software does. Um, it's also definitely possible to control what software gets installed by having lists of good and bad vendors and software. And for example, do you care about code signing or not? Um, you can configure things to be only signed by certain known people, although that is not perfect. You will get a lot of false positives that way, but it's better than, than nothing. So let's see. All right. Um, another thing, and um, Adrian was talking about this a little bit earlier, but you definitely want to track expiration dates, um, both for your software licenses, as potentially you have support issues coming up and you need support or the thing will stop working. You also want to track your domains and your SSL certificates because people can do lots of bad things to your site, to your reputation, uh, to your internet presence if you haven't monitored these things and haven't been able to renew them before they expire. So uh, next is continuous vulnerability management. Remember when I was talking about well, OK, I was going to say the security gal, but it's obviously me worrying about a vulnerability announcement from a software vendor. Continuous vulner vulnerability management is the other way that I help keep myself from getting too nervous about these things. So part one of continuous vulnerability management is scanning. There is nothing that the security community likes to talk about more than a vulnerability with a logo and a website. <laughs> so Heartbleed started that off back in 2014. 
and many other vulnerabilities have been branded since. Some of them are important, some of them are less so. Um, people have strong opinions about the kind of vulnerabilities that should deserve to get a logo. <laughs> and um, tech publications, though, will definitely tend to pay more attention to the ones with a logo because they think they've got a ready-made little graphic they can use. And that's not necessarily good, but it is how it is. So OK, scanning. Scan early, scan often. Um, weekly is what's recommended to do your vulnerability scans. Um, I'm, I'm not going to recommend that you scan less frequently, but a really important component of that to me is making sure that when you scan, you're actually able to remediate. You have the resources available to remediate if you find something. So if you do those scans and you don't go and fix things, well, that's just creating additional stress for your security team and potentially additional cost if you're paying for them by the scan. Um, let's see. Authenticated scans versus non-authenticated scans. Right. So pretty easy. Authenticated scans are the ones where the user has a valid username and password credential. And non-authenticated scans are the ones where they're not. So back in the day, um, and I know that, that um, Seth was talking about this a little bit earlier, back in the day they assumed that there was a perimeter that was this big finite thing and you were either inside the, per the perimeter where all the good stuff was or you're like outside the perimeter and you're on the internet and there is this hard protection. Well, nowadays that's not so true anymore. So I, I recommend when you scan that you do both credentialed and non-credentialed scans from inside and outside of your network because you never really know where the ends of your network are, especially if you have any kind of relationships with partners or vendors or so on and so forth. As Target found out, unfortunately, they got hacked through one of their uh, vendors that had a tie-in to their corporate network. So um, let's see, right. Uh, one other thing about the credentials that you will use, you sh obviously you should not use a, an administrative level credential to scan. You want to have it be a low level because you might see some some things that you probably might be interesting. It might have more of an impact on your systems. OK, so uh, before we go on, I really kind of need to talk about risk. Um, it's not just a board game or a computer game or whatever. Um, so risk is really important to your business's ability to um, manage what they're working on. Um, it's, the, the definition is threat plus vulnerability. And so what that is is the threat is the um, what, what kind of assets you're protecting. Um, so like a threat is, hey, I have, we'll get back to this later, but I have an S3 bucket with some really important information in my company. The vulnerability is that, you know, maybe there is a new API way to get to the contents of an S3 bucket that maybe doesn't require authentication. This is not an actual thing, by the way. Um, Amazon is doing really great things about S3 buckets. More on that later. But you take the, the threatened thing and the vulnerability and put those together, and that's the risk to the business. So there are things that are, are no risk, like, hey, we're not even using that software. No way for it to be exploited to low risk. Okay, well, we're using that software, but there's a lot of access control between everything else and the system that's running that software. And then there's high risk, which is, oh, um, yeah, we're running that on something that's internet facing and it's open to the world. That's pretty high risk. And you definitely want to be aware of those things because it will help you figure out how you're going to handle the next part of continuous vulnerability management, which is patching. So, yeah, you definitely want to remediate those serious vulnerabilities, the ones with high risk, first. I know that it can be encouraging to say, hey, I can get a quick win by patching this thing, but it's not the highest risk. That really doesn't necessarily improve the security of your company very much. So keep in mind that it's really safest for your company if you start at the top of the risky things and then you work your way down. Um, let's see. Yeah, you are definitely going to want to use your automation to make sure that updates are applied everywhere. Um, although, 
common practice to test out those updates in your dev environment, in your QA environment, rather than just rolling them immediately using your automation tools out to every system. Um, you know, I, I know some otherwise good companies that are hesitating to upgrade one of their tools because they know that it would break some things in their production site, and obviously that would be bad. Okay. Um, controlled use of admin privileges. Um, not everybody needs to be admin. Um, if you can work it that way, not everybody needs to be admin of their own laptop or workstation. Um, certainly, not everybody needs to be able to log into production. So how do you do this? Um, well, every time you keep the ways that people get higher privilege restricted, and yes, you log the attempts that they're making to assume those higher privileges, you're making your company safer. Um, you know, it's easy when you're starting out to build things where you don't worry so much about those credentials and everything runs at a high level because that's how the tutorial is and you don't know a lot about it. And it's a lot harder later on as you're growing, as you're getting more aware of these things to reduce those privileges, but it's critically important to do that. Um, so one thing that, oh, I've already talked about the separate accounts for admin. Awesome. Go me. Um, so all right, how do you automate this stuff? Um, well, uh, Seth said earlier today that secrets should be treated more like cattle rather than like pets. Um, humans obviously are not either cattle or pets, <laughs> but you know, every human is unique, but their, uh, the things that they're configured to access are not. Um, you can put them very easily into groups and roles based on the things that they need to do. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about this, so it's also really, e it's a lot easier for onboarding and offboarding and or switching roles when you find that you don't actually need those privileges anymore. Um, common practice when you're starting out you just, as someone who's been like the first operations or whatever, will just keep getting more and more and more privileges. Um, it's really good to remove those privileges if you don't need them anymore. Um, likewise, um, groups, functional names. Um, you are less likely to run into scope creep if you have really descriptive names for your groups. Um, so if you have a group called SEC Logging Read Only, um, you are less likely to just add random new person to that and have them get more than read-only access versus just a group that's called logging. Um, so that, that's another good way to control uh, admin privileges is using descriptive names. Okay, secure default configs. If you're as secure as you can be by default, you reduce your attack surface and also the amount of late night stressing that your security gal is doing. And I need to start talking faster. So how do you secure your configs in an automated way? Um, number one, you start with a, a good security standard because they've done most of the work for you. And um, you can also use your automation or configuration management tools to, to enforce security. Like for example, you can use your uh, laptop configuration suite to see who needs to update Chrome and possibly to automatically remove Adobe Flash from every machine in your environment unless your automation tool actually re requires Adobe Flash, which there is a, a well-known tool that sadly that does this. Um, okay, so another thing you can do is you can use gold images. Um, and you want to definitely reg regularly evaluate the security of those because if you don't update them, then you're becoming less and less secure. So um, user directives and then automation. Um, quickly, that's where you're starting out maybe with a policy that says, hey, please make sure that the firewall is turned on on your laptop. Please make sure you've disabled Bluetooth if you can versus later on as your company grows bigger and you're, it's worth it to invest in an automation suite you want to um, start doing that automatically rather than just asking people to do that and hoping that they comply. Okay, log, log all the things. Um, so like, um, 
it's, it can be hard to do this when you're starting out, but it's still really, really important. There's so much that you can get from your logging, and everybody should do it. Um, interestingly, the logging control used to, it used, they used to use top five. I'm so glad that they've switched the schemes because otherwise this was going to be a talk about the top five critical security controls, plus a couple of others that I think are really important. So yeah, log all the things um, quickly because I am not talking nearly fast enough. Um, you definitely want to log your network devices. You want to pay a lot of attention to outbound traffic because that should be really a, a very, very small amount of traffic and you can find some really interesting things in there if you happen to see additional traffic. Um, okay, let's skip the rant about SIMs. Um, you have to be at a certain level of security maturity to want a SIM in two minutes, I know. Um, okay, so there are 14 more. I'm not gonna go into that anymore. Just say, hey, there's lots on the website, but I do wanna talk a little bit about data protection. It's been in the news a lot lately. So checking things into GitHub, it's really easy to accidentally check in passwords, AWS keys, other kinds of private stuff. And uh, the problem with that is that once you've done so, people, hackers will find it. If it, your repo is public, um, Dome 9, a cloud security company, went and found that they published some API keys and they were found three minutes later. So don't panic. However, if you did check some stuff in, you want to make sure that you remove that commit rather than committing over it, because if you commit over it, then if you just, people just go back to that previous commit, data's still there. So you remove it. Obviously, you're gonna want to rotate those credentials, and um, truffle hog is great. Um, all right, S3 buckets, very quickly. AWS is now setting them private by default. Amazon Macy is really useful. Um, now it will monitor not only whether the permissions are public or not, but also the contents. And um, be careful with the S3 bucket names. If it starts with prod, it's probably interesting. If it starts with your company name, it's probably interesting. Okay, so there's more. But we have run out of time, so I'm just gonna say I did publish these slides. I will go ahead and jump to the important thing. TLDR, you probably already are your security team's best friend because you're probably doing so many of these things. And if you're not, well, hey, you know, you've got a good list of things to get started on. So thank you very much, and these are the references.